Hey everybody, welcome to Comedy on Vinyl. This week we have Scott Aukerman, and it is awesome. Uh, also, I wanted to announce officially that our guests for the Comedy on Vinyl live podcast coming up on May 28th, which is a Monday at 7.30 p.m. at Improv Olympic West here in Los Angeles, uh, is David Anthony Higgins and Jeremy Guskin. It's going to be amazing. David Anthony Higgins, of course, was on Ellen. He was on Malcolm in the Middle. And he's also in one of the great underrated comedies of all time, the wrong guy it's great it's a wonderful film uh we are definitely going to be talking about that even though we'll talk about whatever album he wants to talk about um but yeah uh david anthony higgins jeremy guskin who is obviously a regular they're both going to be on the show uh mike will be there as well please get your tickets at ticketweb.com and uh they're only five dollars a piece you can get a two-for-one deal if you show the event uh invite on your phone or print it out at the door uh, make sure that you RSVP on the uh, the event page on Facebook, which you can get to through our Facebook page, facebook.com slash comedy on vinyl. Thank you so much and enjoy this episode. From the Narzi Film Company, uh, Herr Adolf Hartler. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Herr Hartler. Hi, Hartler. How are you? Uh, now, uh, this, uh, this is a strange name. It's Narzi Films. Uh, yes, we, well, we, well... That we, doesn't have anything to do with Nazi, does it? No, are you kidding? We, we, they are worst enemies. We are against them. We always were. I had a... <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> well, uh, I, I've heard that... In my own home, we, we hit a Jewish family. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, I've heard that there were many Germans who... We hit them for a while and then turned them over to the Gestapo. (laughs) But, you know... Sir, what did you do personally during the war? Oh, well, I was a baby during the war. I was maybe four or five years old. It was terrible. I mean, I didn't know what was going on. I was so confused. Sir, just a moment. Just a moment. We little German tykes were confused. Well, sir, it's hard for me to believe that you were a little German tyke because you look to me to be a man of 60, 65 years old. Oh, well, you know, we had nothing to eat, and I... (laughs) I've aged terribly. All right, everybody, welcome to Comedy on Vinyl. This week we're doing uh, Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks live from the Cannes Film Festival. And our guest this week is Scott Ackerman. Hello, Jason. Hello, all the ships at sea. Um, so, why did you pick this particular album? I know you said you didn't listen to it on vinyl first, but... No, I listened to it on tape, which is an old format that... Uh, it, I, I guess it actually is tape. I don't know. It, mm-hmm. It's literally like tape Actual. that you would, you would put through a machine and it uh-huh. would... It would uh, sounds would come out of it. Oh, is that how that worked? <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty old. I know you mainly work with vinyl. Yeah. but this is a pretty old format. Sure, sure, sure. But because um, <clears> that <throat> your superior sound quality and yes. mm-hmm, actually, I I may have heard. I'm trying to remember, but uh, the first track I ever heard from it was the uh, 2,000 year old man track, uh-huh. and I heard that as part of a different set. I might have had that on CD, but it, that probably was tape, too. But that was uh, part of the American comedy box set, oh, okay. I believe. I don't yeah. know if you've ever seen that. Around, I have seen it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of it is pretty uh, undistinguished mm-hmm. or classic in a way that wasn't really I wasn't really relating to. Sure. You know, like, uh, I can't remember what's on there, but stuff to the effect of, say, who's on first is on there. Sure. It would sure. be, you know, just kind of... A recording of Who's On First, and I wasn't really, you know, responding to it. But then that track was on this box set, and I immediately just really sparked to it. Yeah. And I I think the reason I picked it is not because it's the album that I've listened to the most Mm -hmm. um, out of comedy records, because that would maybe be um, Bill Cosby himself, probably, or something like that. But I, I, I think I picked it because... It has, excuse me, it has the most direct influence on what I do right now. It's really a lot like what I do on the podcast and and what I'll be doing in the TV show. Sure. So, and I I think that that was kind of unconscious in my mind Mm -hmm. until recently. Recently I started thinking about these records. Yeah. And I realized, oh, wow, this is exactly what I have been doing. Yeah. I didn't even put two and two together until you brought it up, and I'm just, holy shit, this is perfect. Two and two equals four. That is so true. Now we all realize. Yeah. 
But at the time, who no, knew? No, nobody knew. It was... <laughs> But yeah, I, pi- I, I picked it for that reason, mainly because I think it's had the most um, influence on my work. Yeah. Um, so I think that what I responded to it back when I first heard it, back in probably, I think I heard it 1993, 1994. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom, I don't know if you have this experience, do you? I don't know, do you have parents? I do. Still with I have at least two. Yeah. So if you ever develop an interest, um, or a hobby, or or something of that effect. Mm-hmm. Um, my my parents will then try to give me Christmas gifts or birthday uh-huh. gifts relating to that hobby. Sure. So I think back in 1994, when I first heard it, I think I was I had an interest in comedy. I hadn't mm-hmm. started it yet, but I had an interest in it. So that's why I got that box set. Yeah. Um, and what what I really responded to it, I remember is the improv nature of it. Yeah. The um, the fact that Carl Reiner is trying to trip up Mel Brooks. Yeah. yeah. And Mel Brooks is trying to overcome questions that he's just thinking of on the spot. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> and you can really hear it on the record. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that these records are so successful because um, they're not just recitations of like a script that those guys wrote. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a shtick, but not in the same way. I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to repeat itself every time. I mean, they, the most recent one they did was, I think it was the year 2000. It wasn't as good, but, you know, they can mm-hmm. still do it. Yeah, and, and, you know, I mean, take Abbott and Costello doing Who's On First. Sure. Okay. So they worked at that routine. They probably worked on it in their live, you know, routine over the years. But they honed it down to a script. Sure. And it's a really tight script, and mm-hmm. they perform it as a routine on TV shows, they did it in movies, yeah. but it's, there's something lacking in the scripted part of it sure. that really shines through on this record, because these guys are making it up as they go along. Yeah. Um, and when I, when I first heard it, it was <clears throat> at a really influential time, it's, it's really right before I started doing comedy, mm-hmm. um, I heard this. Which made me go out and buy the box set of all the of course, records. Of course, um, I heard or I saw an Andy Kaufman <laughs> special uh-huh. on NBC. That yeah. they, I, I forget why they were um, airing it, but I, I really had no idea about Andy Kaufman's life or sure. or career other than he was on Taxi. Was that the one? Did they interview you? Was it late enough that Jim Carrey was interviewed in that one? I think it was Jim Carrey was. Yeah, interviewed that's the for first that. special I ever saw about him too. Yeah, I had no idea who he was really, other yeah. than he was the guy on Taxi. Exactly. And so it was relevant or revelatory rather. Mm-hmm. I keep mispronouncing that word. That's fine. I do too. I don't <laughs> say relevant, but yeah, that my, yeah. my 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 was my parents would tell me, yeah, of course Andy Kaufman did that shit, and I was kind of pissed off that they didn't tell me anymore about it. Right. Because he didn't really. I mean, he had he had a couple of specials, I think. Mm-hmm. Which you can still get, but he didn't put out a comedy record or anything, and that's mainly how I listened to yeah. or, or saw comedy because I didn't have HBO. I sure, didn't, um, you know, Comedy Central wasn't really a thing at that point. Of course. You know? So, so I, I saw Andy Kaufman. I saw Bob and David do their live show leading up to them getting Mr. Show, uh-huh. and it was called the Cross Odenkirk Problem. Okay. And then I and I listen to this and those three things I think <clears throat> I would say the cross Odenkirk thing and the Andy Kaufman thing mm-hmm. had more to do with what I was doing back then when I first started uh-huh. and I sort of forgot about these records. Sure. And we did a um, uh, B J Porter and I who were in something called the Fun Bunch. We we did something influenced by these. Mm-hmm. Um, where I was the Mel Brooks person and he was the Carl Reiner mm-hmm. guy interviewing me. But that was just one bit out of a lot of bits that we did back then. So I haven't really thought about it very sure. much. But when I started thinking a few months ago about these records again, I realized, holy shit, this is exactly what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Um, so I listened to him again, and it's, it's really kind of fascinating to listen to it back when I first listened to do it I always imagined I would be the Mel Brooks guy sure sure. you know being the funny guy who's coming up with and riffing with stuff you right. know off the top of my head but now it's interesting doing what I do now to listen to it and be paying attention to Carl Reiner a little more mm-hmm. and seeing 
what he's doing and how he's leading Mel Brooks yeah. into stuff, and which is kind of what I do on the podcast. Yeah, I noticed more, and I should we should mention, even though there's no way they haven't listened to yours if they're listening to mine, but Comedy Bang Bang is obviously <laughs> the podcast and the, the IFC show. There are so many ways. <laughs> That's, yeah. when, does the, wait, when does the show start on IFC? Uh, IFC's show starts June 8th. June 8th, okay. Um, but uh, I told totally you... And on that, that show... Yes, keep on going. That, on that show, you know... If people haven't heard it, it's basically I'm the host character, Mm -hmm. and I'm interviewing real people, but then I'm also interviewing characters, which is what Mel Brooks does on these records. Mm -hmm. He doesn't just do the 2,000-year-old man, by the way, which maybe a lot of people don't know, but he does several characters on each record. Mm -hmm. The only one that he did um, the 2,000 man for the whole time was the fourth one, and maybe they did a fifth one since then. So... But the 2,000-year-old man was the uh, most successful. Stand out, and then they did a film of it, a short film, which I think they did some the shorts, Oscars, yeah. If I remember correctly. They also did it, and speaking to the improvisational nature of these, they did it um, on several TV shows, like mm-hmm. maybe the Steve Allen show, I'm not sure. God, awesome. But they, they had to script it for that. Yeah. So it just, Mel Brooks hated doing it, supposedly, sure. and it just lost everything that kind of made it special. I bet about it. Um, but if, if you haven't heard my show, I do, I do want to say this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you haven't heard my show, it's me talking to real people and then talking to characters a lot akin to what Mel Brooks does on this. And my role on it is to... We never know where it's going. We never plan it out. So mm-hmm. my, it's my role to either uh, lead it and steer it into a direction that I think is worthwhile exploring and yeah. also sometimes to trip up the person or to press them on a, on a point sure. and make them come up with something in the moment, which is, I think, what makes my show so unique. Yeah, yeah. You force them in a lot of ways. I really love that about the show. Uh, sir, yeah. are there any more secrets you're ready to divulge about why and how to live 2,000 years? Well, one of the big things that's kept me rolling along singing a song is uh, <laughs> garlic. Garlic has kept you alive? How can garlic keep you alive? Well, garlic keeps you alive because, well, you know how you die, don't you? The scientific reason how you die is that the angel of death, see, (laughs) rings your apartment bell and you let him in and bang, you know. Comes comes in and says, okay, Murray, this is it. (laughs) And uh, you... And so how, how, does garlic, how does garlic help? Usually comes at night, right? Yes. So before I retire, I'll eat myself a nice pound and a half garlic. <laughs> then I lay down in bed and I pull up my crazy quilt. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll uh, start to retire and snore. And how does the garlic help? Well, the angel of death, you know, comes in. He comes over to me, taps me on the shoulder. I say, who is it? <laughs> and usually he goes, whoop! He takes out. right off. I He's see. out the door. That's well, that's an interesting theory. Sure. You know about the kiss of death, right? Yes. Sure, he's not going to kiss me. I'm full of garlic. But, I mean, you're, that's one thing that I was thinking about listening to this as well. Carl Reiner, who we've seen play plenty of characters. I mean, this is not... He's a straight man, but he's got enough of a character. He's willing to laugh. You do a similar thing on your podcast. He laughs too. a lot more, actually, in the second and third one. It's really interesting. Yeah. If you listen to the first one, he he almost... Reiner kind of sounds like he is worried the mm-hmm. whole time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, because if, uh, if people don't know the background of these records, this was something they did at a party, yeah. which... You know, back in the... It would have been the late 50s, I think, because this came out in 61, maybe. Yeah. Um, parties were the original podcasts. Yeah. I don't know if people remember mm-hmm. that, but people mm-hmm. used to have parties instead of hosting podcasts. So um, so they would do this at parties um, where it was just kind of like a party game where Carl Reiner would turn to Mel Brooks and ask him a weird off-ball... Off-ball? Oddball <laughs> question. Off-the-wall and oddball I question. Like um... So they be there are a couple of off balls, mm-hmm. um, and, and Mel Brooks would launch into this, and so they they were um, doing this at a party, and Steve Allen was there and insisted, "Oh, you got to make a record, you got to make a record," and they were saying, "No, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. It's too inside. Sure, no one would think this is funny. It's too Jewish." Was another thing uh-huh. that they thought. Yeah, and then George. Burns, I believe, came up to them and mm-hmm. said, 
are you making a record? And they said, no, I don't think so. He goes, okay, I'm going to steal it then. <laughs> and, which was a common thing back then, sure, you know. of course. So they said, oh, shit, we got to make a record. So they went and made this record. So if you listen to Carl Reiner on the first one, I think this is before it's a proven thing, before mm-hmm. he knows if anyone will think this is funny or not. Sure. So he sounds very worried and trying to steer it and yeah. trying to rein it in and trying to control it a little more. Mm-hmm. Which, um, I, I've been there, so I know exactly, sure. especially when you don't have a lot of time, um, you're constantly trying to rein it something in and, and make it not go off the rails too right. much, you know? Like, if you only have 15 minutes with a person, you're constantly trying to get them back on track. Yeah. He sounds like he's constantly trying to get Mel back on track. Yeah. But then the second and third records... He laughs more, mm-hmm. he seems more at ease with it, it's, yeah. been, it's a proven thing, and which is sort of where I'm at now, where yeah. I can just kind of like relax a little more, I tend to laugh at the bits a little more, yeah. and, and um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting difference. It seems to, I mean, obviously it's an amplified version of U2, what, where, where do you U2 come from? U2 the band, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, what do you use it? <laughs> it's, where does it come from for you? I mean, is it just you fucking around with your own sense of humor, or are you... How are you amplifying you? Well, I mean, I, I've I've said <clears throat> I've said this recently, but um, I do view the character that I do on the show as a character. Mm-hmm. Um, it is an amplified version of my own personality. Obviously, my personality sometimes leaks in. Like I can I can hear it on mm-hmm. the show if I ever listen to them, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I try not to. Sure, but um, if I ever listen to one back, I'll go, "Oh, that's me dropping character and actually having a real moment." Okay. Um, for instance, uh, we're recording this the week uh, uh, Bobcat Goldthwaite's episode came out. Yeah. And sometimes I, I um, if I have someone on for the first time, I'll tend to do a lengthy interview with them. Yeah. I think that one lasted maybe 30 minutes mm-hmm. or something before I bring a character in. Um, just to acclimate them to the show so not sure. too much craziness is happening right from the start. So... When I, tend, when I do the real interviews with someone, and I've known Bob for a long time, but I'm not, you know, as comfortable, excuse me, with him as, as other people, I tend to um, be a little more real and, and be yeah. a little more, I am sort of like a good interviewer, searching for an in sure. to make a joke, mm-hmm. <clears throat> or to lead the conversation into a, a humorous place, Yeah. but I do think that... For the most part, if I had my druthers, I would do the show with people who get it all the time, yeah. and we would never talk about anything real, sure, <laughs> and sure, it would sure. just be fake bits the entire time. Mm-hmm. But you can't always do that, because the show is different every week. I don't have, you know, Paula Tonkins is maybe the closest to a person, or, or James Adomi is closest to a, a, a regular, yeah. and even he only does it every month or so. Sure. So, you know, I have to work with different people every single week, so it's a little more akin to a talk show. Yeah. Which is interesting for me because it's a, um, I mean, it's it, that's where the format sort of developed of talking to real people mixed with fake people. Because yeah. if I had a, a group of people like Paul F. or James or Seth Morris who were on every single week, mm-hmm. I think the show would have would, would have gone into a different direction where I just talked to crazy people every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the TV show probably wouldn't have happened because that's a big part of the TV show is right. the celebrities that I can get on the show and, and involve them in the craziness. Okay. Um, is, is this, was this, I doubt it, but I mean, was it your first exposure to Mel Brooks or is it just your first exposure to this side of Mel Brooks? No, I, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, I grew up in the 70s. Sure. I think I grew up in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Let me check. Yeah, I grew up in the All 70s. Right. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, you know, I, I was aware of Blazing Saddles. Yeah. I was aware of, of Young Frankenstein. I think I probably saw them edited on TV a mm-hmm. lot. So I, I knew who he was, and, I, you know, Spaceballs came out, and I, I remember when it came out just thinking, oh, you're parodying Star Wars now? Right. You know, yeah. it was, as I recall, it was like three, maybe four years after Return of yeah, the Jedi like came out. Yeah. And at the time, I just thought that was an eternity, like, yeah. you know... Now, of course, like, Robot Chicken is still parodying Star sure. Wars, you yeah, know, it yeah, doesn't yeah. Family Guy do... Yeah, they you did, know. Like three full parodies of it. Yeah, so it's, you know, I don't know what my problem was at the time. <laughs> I still have not seen Spaceballs, uh-huh. um, because I just was like, that looks corny, and... Yeah, and, and it's, so, not, it's not gonna hold up. So I think, I think I had a thing against 
not against Mel Brooks because yeah. I always knew to respect him, mm-hmm. but I, I was just not interested in him. Sure. So when I heard this, I got very interested in him. Mm-hmm. I went back and revisited Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, The Producers. All of those quickly became some of my favorite films. Sure. And so, yeah, I mean, it was it was really what made me sort of rediscover him. And they they say that this is like the most Mel Brooks of anything he's ever done. Mm-hmm. Like it, it it really is. You know, in, in Blazing Saddles or whatever, he has a script. He sure. w- works on it for months. This is just pure, like, his mind operating at a level of instinctual comedy, which is right. just amazing to behold. It's probably, the, it's probably the closest picture you're going to get to what he was like behind the scenes of, like, your show shows. Right. As much as people said he was a raging dick, like, it's still <laughs> probably the funniest he's, he, he mm-hmm. is. Um, is, uh, well then, <clears throat> I guess the, the, do you at all miss having comedy albums just physically in your hands is that something that was ever important to you it was re- i mean it was very important to me i uh, the first record i ever bought was bill cosby's himself yeah um and the footloose single nice <laughs> um but so so I, I was really into that <clears throat> and i didn't even know it was a movie mm-hmm. until i was maybe 15 and my teacher showed it in class really strangely really but um, I listened to that. I, I listened to Billy Crystal's Marvelous uh-huh. record over and over and over. Awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, Eddie Murphy. Mm-hmm. And I, I... Someone got a hold of me recently, an old friend from high school, to let me know that he had my Joe Piscopo, Eddie Murphy, uh, Honeymooners rap 12-inch. Oh, my God. <laughs> that um, that uh, he had borrowed. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so, and I play a lot of comedy music on, yeah. on my show, so I definitely do, I listen to Dr. Demento mm-hmm. every single week, Yeah, Weird Al Yankovic, very into, it's, I mean, it's one of the <clears throat> major thrills of my life to actually sort of know him now, yeah, you know, I mean, if it's one of those things where it's very common to say, if I could have only told myself when I was yeah. age, whatever, but <clears throat> that's one of the big ones for me of... Sure. of I was so upset when I couldn't go see him live mm-hmm. in 1984, I think, for his In 3D record. Fuck. Yeah. I was so upset. My parents wouldn't let me go for some reason. Mm-hmm. And just to, like, be able to say, hey, you're not only are you going to see him, you're going to mm-hmm. hang out with him, you'll get, to, he'll be on your TV show, yeah. you know, it's a, a major thrill for me. So, do I, do I miss having records? I do, but at the same time, um... I'm around so much comedy right now that, yeah. that personally I don't miss it because I just don't know. I mean, I, I yeah. still get records from all my friends and stuff. Sure. And it's out, I mean, comedy is out there yeah. more so than ever if you want to get it. But sure. I just personally don't have a lot of time to, to I, I have the Richard Pryor box set mm-hmm. of all of his records. I haven't listened to a single one. Yeah. I've had it for seven years, maybe. <laughs> I still have not listened to any of them, so. That makes sense. You have a chapter here, sir. Entitled, Your Mate Controls Your Weight. Would you explain that? That's quite true. I think it's self-explanatory, but I will delve into it if you want me to. (laughs) It isn't self-explanatory. You mean if you're happy, you gain weight? Yes. Uh, No, not at all. Au contraire, my dear fair. No. (laughs) Uh, Actually, uh, as far as controlling weight is concerned, let's say you have uh, a bulldog for a wife. Now, uh, you're going to keep your nose in your mashed potatoes at dinner, and you're going to eat your string beans, and you're not really going to pay too much attention to her. You don't want to look up. Let's say you're married to uh, one of them Lolitas, you know, one of those 16-year-olders or something. If you've got the guts to do it, I never have. (laughs) I'll follow him for a block or two, and then that's it. You know? For um, son of a bitch, I did it again. I had a fucking complaint. Oh, you yeah, that's part. such a good question. All right, so I, here I, we really go. Did. I promise. I was you talking I about. Uh, oh, here we go. I oh, got it. Here we go. Yeah. So, All right. Obviously, I'm just gonna sit back. Yeah. I'm gonna let the magic happen. Thank you so much. You're just gonna hit me with it, and mm-hmm. and we'll just uh, revel in it. Okay. All right. I've forgotten it again. No, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, are there, I've talked with a few people about specifically like sketch comedy albums. This, mm-hmm. I mean, this is obviously improv. There, there, there's sketches. I usually think of sketches as something that's written. Yeah. But um, are there any? Because again, you're in the comedy world. Are there people releasing sketch comedy albums that I'm not realizing? Because like, um, that's something that I miss personally. I just saw yesterday that this group, The Midnight Show, who uh-huh. does uh, UCB. Yeah. Uh, they're releasing one. Awesome. Um, I talked about doing one at one point. Mm-hmm. Actually, AST Records wanted me to do one. Mm-hmm. 
and um, it just uh, is not something I can focus on right now. Sure. But um, yeah, I mean, I tried before before I had uh, the Comedy Bang Bang podcast. I actually recorded one episode of a more sketchy podcast mm-hmm. uh, with um, Paul Rust and Neil Campbell, uh-huh. and those were we had some sketches, but we mainly had ideas for sketches yeah. that we would riff on, and, <laughs> you know, good sketches, like two and a half minutes, three sure. minutes, we would do 14 minute of course. long, 15 minute long sketches, where we never even got to the game of the sketch <laughs> until minute eight, because it was just us riffing and being idiots and right. doing anti-comedy. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm definitely interested in the form. I used to listen to the Monty Python records a lot, and... and um, but at the same time, I mean, a lot of times those existed because it was difficult to get to see sketch yeah. back in those days. Sure. It's not that difficult now. No. I mean, you may as well just, like, you could almost say that any group would put out 12 Funny or Die videos, mm-hmm. that's an album right there. Sure. You know what I mean? So, is uh, if, if you were to do one, if that does happen, would it be all improv? Or... I don't know. I mean, there's something about... That's the thing, is is right now, if I wanted to do a sketch, I could do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the TV show, or, yeah. or for Fighting or Die, or something like that. So, But at the same time, when I was doing a, a sketch show a few years back, we wrote all these amazing sketches for it that just will never see the light of day. You know, like, Bob Odenkirk is a guy who, he writes a great sketch... He puts it in a drawer, mm-hmm. and then he will pull it out at, at a certain time. Actually, uh-huh. on the uh, the fifth episode of, of my show, mm-hmm. he does a character on it that he has been thinking about doing for 20 years, I believe. Holy shit. <laughs> He's had this idea for 20 years. He's talked about it with a few people. Oh, my God. He happened to talk about it with the Birthday Boys, who are a sketch group, mm-hmm. and... Uh, two of them were writers on my show, and they brought up, oh, Bob has this character that would be perfect for your show, and so we asked Bob to do it, and he just, you know, he'd been That's sitting insane. on it forever. That's insane. He did that for the Jimmy Kimmel show, too, where, like, he'd been talking about this one character he wanted to do of a Jack LaLanne um, guy who has a lot of energy, who uh-huh. exercises all the time, like mm-hmm. a 75, 80-year-old sure. guy, and who then... You strip off a bunch of his makeup, and he's wearing old age makeup, and that's why he has so much energy, and it's all a sham. I forget exactly what it was, but mm-hmm. but he talked about that sketch forever, yeah. and then he just kind of ran out of places to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, we tried to get a sketch movie going, and all sorts of stuff, and he ended up just doing it on the Jimmy Kimmel show, because he's like, I don't want to waste this idea, so he just did it there. That's hilarious. But, um... I would almost rather do a sketch movie. Uh-huh. The great thing about an album, though, is you can record it really easily. Yeah. You know, I have the podcast company, which we could record it there. I yeah. mean, Mike Detective is a lot like a sure. sketch record. Mm-hmm. Mike Detective is a, a podcast that we did last year. We did 13 episodes, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, a serialized five-minute, um, five to ten sometimes minute episodes. I mean, so mm-hmm. that's like, if you listen to those back-to-back, that's like a sketch record. Sure. It's produced like a sketch record. It's very yeah. influenced by them. Um, but, yeah, maybe. I mean, who knows? The, the great thing about it is I would probably put it out, through though, as a podcast through my company. Sure. Rather, and then turn it into a record mm-hmm. or something if like people that. people wanted to buy it, they yeah. could. Yeah. God, that'd be amazing. Have you had the opportunity to meet Mel Brooks or Carl Reiner? No, the closest I've come is there's a producer who runs uh, Red Hour, Ben Stiller's Mm -hmm. um, production company, Stuart Kornfeld, who's a great guy. I've worked with him on a few projects, and he used to be Mel's assistant. Uh, That may be be, uh, not as good of a job title as he may have had, but Mm -hmm. I think it was assistant. So he's told me a lot of stories. About him, but that I couldn't even repeat. Sure, um, sure. But um, that's the closest I've ever been. I, I love Mel Brooks. I would love to. Um, I mean, he's not, you know, working a lot nowadays. Sure. But I would love to just meet him. And, Has he done a podcast? I feel like he might have done a few. I just I would like to hear. I've never heard of him doing a podcast. The last thing I've ever I ever saw him do is that Dick Cavett 
Conversations with Mel Brooks HBO show that was on oh, about a year ago. Okay, all right. Which Carl Reiner was in the audience and stood up and like asked Mel a question, and they spent like five minutes on Carl Reiner. And I was like, "That's what I want to see. I yeah. want to see Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks talk to each other, not oh, Dick shit. Cavett." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all Dick Cavett would do is like tell stories that someone else told him. Yeah. You know? Oh, we're getting a uh, message from the. Uh, oh. Oh no, I'm fine. Thank you so much. <laughs> this sounds like an episode of Hefner's Playboy Club, but a podcast. <laughs> you want another drink, hon? <laughs> um, uh, did you ever make any friends over no. comedy? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. over <laughs> comedy. More to it, yeah. Meaning when I was a kid, yeah. I yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously now, but yeah, like listening to albums together, watching anything yeah. together. I'm well, when I was here. 15, well, when I was 14, I, my best friend was a couple years older than me. We we uh, met in theater mm-hmm. where we were doing a uh, <clears throat> production of Carousel, Rodgers and Hammerstein's Carousel. Uh-huh. So I met my best friend there, and we had very similar interests um, in terms of comedy. We were very... This is 1984, 1985. Mm-hmm. So we were very into Saturday Night Live, um, which at the time was the 1985 season okay. with B- Billy Crystal, yeah. the aforementioned Billy Crystal, and... Um, Christopher Guest and Martin Short. Yeah. So we would reenact that all the time. We were constantly doing the synchronized swimming. Hey, you. Hey, you. I know you. I know you. We were doing that. We were doing Harry Shearer voices. We were doing Christopher Guest stuff. I mean, Billy Crystal, for all the, you know, whatever he is now. Yeah. I was majorly influenced by him when I was 15. I would do all the impressions that he did. Yeah. Would walk around, you know. I, w- I, w- I was in speech competitions. I would, I would do voices. We had to do something called extemporaneous, I believe, which uh-huh. was like they give you a topic and you riff on it for mm-hmm. for eight minutes. Yeah. And I would just do like comedy. It would. I'd slip into impressions, uh-huh. impressions that Billy Crystal did, or impressions of like Reverend Jim, or awesome. you know stuff like that. So we were really into SNL. We were really into Letterman, who's probably my second or he's he's probably my biggest influence on on the tv show yeah um so those two things and we were into stuff like the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy we were really into Mm -hmm. um uh but the though you know i would say those two things were the big things for us we would constantly watch snl and letterman every single night did is it do you think it's important for people uh learning comedy to copy the, the, the way you did. I mean, does it? I feel like it must happen know. for everybody. I mean, you know, when you're 15, you know, I was also doing speeches where I just basically they would call it HI or humorous interp, which mm-hmm. was you take a script and you you do the script. So mm-hmm. I was doing like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, just like doing impressions of all of them. Uh-huh. You know, but when you're 15 or you're growing up, you don't really know. Well, I mean, that's not. There are a lot of smarter people I think but at the time all I knew was I really loved comedy I don't yeah. know that I thought I could ever do it sure but you, you don't know that hey you know you're not supposed to just like imitate people you mm-hmm. should actually create your own stuff and, I, and that's not to say I didn't I definitely sure. I had my own public access TV show awesome. I was super influenced by Letterman and probably ripped off his cadences or his sardonic nature mm-hmm. but but um Definitely created my own stuff for there, but um, I, you know, I remember reading um, an interview with Radiohead when they put out OK Computer, mm-hmm. and they said that they were basically imitating some other band. I can't remember who it was. Okay. They were trying to do an imitation of that band, yeah, and it came out. They couldn't imitate the band, sure. so it came out the way it came out, right. <clears throat> And that's sort of what art is, in a way. I mean, everyone's influenced by something, and you get ideas, and you try to sort of imitate for a while, and then it just you develop your own style. What did you do two thousand years ago to entertain each other? A were, bucket wing. Well, no, were there? Oh, uh, what were, do you there, mean? were there comedians? Oh, sure, sure. We, we, do you remember any of them? No. Two thousand years ago. Primitive days. Let me see. I remember one comedian gave us some laugh. Boy, we were hysterical. What was who gave was he? Gave us some good laugh. Murray the Nut. <laughs> what what yes. did he do? Oh, did he give us a laugh? 
A tiger came in the cave one afternoon, sauntered in, uninvited, naturally. Nobody asked for a tiger to walk in on you, right? Tiger came in and Murray, you know, the, the joker, the tumbler, you know, the nut. He jumps up and he grabs the tiger by the tail and goes, and he went, yaha, yaha, yaha. And the tiger turned around and ate him up in a minute. And did we get hysterical? We were laughing. Well, that that's uh, that very... the best joke we ever had. Well, sir, that's not very funny. That's well, rather... what did we have, RKO's then? That's all we had. Yeah, but, I mean, that, I would any... consider that... That was the best we had. I would Murray con- took a that, tiger. That was entertainment. Yes. But I would consider that in the realm of tragedy rather than comedy. How do you well, differentiate between tragedy... point of view. Between... To me, tragedy, if it is, if I'll cut my finger, that's tragedy. <laughs> It bleeds, and I'll cry, and I'll run around, and I'll go into Mount Sinai for a day and a half. I'm very nervous about it. And to me, comedy is if you walk into an open sewer and die. What do I care? That's I comedy. See. I see. That's your definition. My finger is important. I see. I do want to stick to the album, but if, if, if you would talk for a second about how you got involved with Mr. Show and what okay. the first steps were to just becoming... Well, I, you know, like I said when I started... Um, those three things, the, the Kaufman, the 2,000-year-old man, and the, and the Mr. Show thing, happened around in the same summer, as I recall, okay. or the same right before summer, mm-hmm. probably in March or something. I think I still have the flyer to the Cross Odenkirk awesome. thing. I think it was in March. Um, those all occurred around the same time, and... and the reason that they had such a big impact on me, I think, was because at the time I was I was I had moved back from LA to LA rather mm-hmm. from um, doing musical theater across the country. Oh, all right. Um, which is what I thought I was going to do. Uh-huh. I went to school for it. I studied Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. I musical theater, and I was kind of trying to do regional theater or make my way to Broadway. Or whatever. Uh-huh. I gave it up because I thought it was kind of boring. Yeah. Because um, I. Mainly because I, I uh, hated changing clothes. Uh-huh. Um, I hated putting on makeup. I hated changing clothes. I hated any time anyone else was talking in the play. <laughs> um, which then, you know, I got into stand-up, which is like, you wear your own clothes, sure. you talk about yourself, and you can drink. Yeah, yeah. You know. So, I had moved back to L.A., I was trying to be a writer then. Mm-hmm. I knew I wanted to work in movies or TV or something. So um, BJ Porter and I wrote a pilot, a television pilot, like a one-hour Beverly Hills 90210, but funny okay. pilot, <laughs> which um, kind of turned out to be sort of like the OC. The okay. OC sort of turned out, you know, but the, at the time, no one was ready for sure. it. It was like, you got to be, you know, if they wanted you to, if you were doing an hour, to be, you know, a drama, sure. basically. So... Um, so I was kind of fucking around. I didn't know what to do. And I had a, a friend that I had done theater with whose roommate was Karen Kilgariff, who's a, uh, a stand-up. And so she, I would go hang out with her every once in a while. And she would, I remember her introducing me to Odenkirk mm-hmm. at a, at a bar. And he, he said... Um, I don't know why he took he, he he's he's very uh, he always takes kind of an interest in people he always like that's one really interesting thing about Bob is like if you just meet him he'll be very interested in you and want yeah. to ask you a bunch of questions so he asked me oh I said I was trying to be a writer he's like oh what do you write for and I was like nothing yet I just you know mm-hmm. I've written plays and I've you know have this script. Um, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know he wrote for SNL. I didn't know yeah. he wrote for Get a Life and all this kind of stuff. Right. So I was kind of hanging out a little bit in the comedy scene, but um, when my friend Maleva said, hey, you know, I read your script and I don't really like it, <laughs> um, you know, it's like halfway between a drama. It's like, I don't like the drama part of it. Yeah. But you're a really funny guy. Why aren't you writing funny scripts sure. and why aren't, you, why aren't you doing comedy and I was like I don't think I could do comedy I, I don't know you know I I had a sense of humor that everyone found to be annoying which <laughs> which was is is to say that what and what I found out is that um, people found it annoying because people people don't like people trying to be funny right 
by basically I had I had uh, I was a waiter mm-hmm. at Chin Chin here in LA, and all the other waiters, whenever I acted like what I do now, mm-hmm. they would get annoyed and say, "Stop trying so hard" or something. Okay. Because people, I don't know if you know this, people hate funny people. They do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They hate people who are actually funny. Sure. Until what happened was I started doing comedy. Mm-hmm. I started doing comedy, and all of a sudden I could say, oh, I'm a comedian. They went, oh, that explains why he's acting that way. And then no one ever had a problem so with it again. they just think you're an asshole until they know you're yes. professionally. Okay. Yeah. Right. That's interesting. So, in any case, I, I just, I always, I, I got this feedback from everyone that I just was annoying and that my sense of humor, I was like, my sense of humor is too out there. What I find funny, I don't think anyone else would find funny. Uh-huh. Um, so, I don't think I could be a comedian. She goes, well, okay, my roommate is in this show, they do it every Sunday night at the comedy store, you know, why don't you just go up one night and try something? Mm-hmm. Um, so, BJ and I talked about it, and we came up with this bit. We, we weren't really comfortable being ourselves, but mm-hmm. we, we thought we would do a bit, which was we were a fake um, improv group <laughs> who, we took a suggestion from the audience, and then it just, I, I forget how, but it devolved into... BJ fucking me in the ass. <laughs> oh, um, so I rem- and I remember doing practicing it a few times for BJ's girlfriend at the time, mm-hmm. and we showed we showed it to her, and she just was like, "Well, <laughs> all right, that's not going to go well." <laughs> and uh, and that and I literally thought it would not go well, but for some reason we had this belief that it was really funny. Uh-huh. So we did it, and it really did well mm-hmm. um it, it it you know just like this because no one knew who we were and they thought sure. we might have actually been a, a really bad improv group yeah, yeah and it i remember when the sketch turned and it turned into and everyone got it just this amazing waves of laughter mm-hmm. um and and then we got asked back to do it you know two weeks later and we became regulars at it yeah um so that's how I sort of got into comedy, and which leads into Mr. Show, which is Bob Odenkirk, who I'd met at that bar, mm-hmm. who probably didn't remember me because I was just some idiot who said he wanted to be a writer. Mm-hmm. He was at the second performance, that one two weeks later. Oh, that's awesome. Because it was people doing the show, it was, it was the people in the scene, as we mm-hmm. called it. It was your Dana Gould, your Janine Graflo, your uh-huh. David Cross, John Ennis, mm-hmm. Bob Odenkirk, Margaret Cho. Um... So, every Sunday night, everyone we knew who was in comedy would be there. Yeah. Hanging out, watching. If they weren't performing, they would watch the people. So, Bob was in the back, and um, I forget exact. Oh, I do remember that bit. It was the one where BJ ended up peeing in my mouth <laughs> at the end of it to humiliate me, and I spit it out and was crying and I said I hate you I hate you and I, I would run out of the room that's usually how our bits ended is me saying I hate you I hate you and then running out of the room so I ran out of the room and I had to, I had to basically run out of the, the belly room at the comedy store which is upstairs so I had to run downstairs then go around to the main room of the comedy store and then run back up through the back and stuff. So I was out of commission. Mm-hmm. But BJ, he ended and he just got to walk back into the crowd. Uh-huh. And Bob was in the back and he came over to BJ and said, Hey, um, oh, that was so funny. Um, <laughs> do you guys, um, do you guys want to maybe write for my TV show? <laughs> um, and, you know, considering Cross and Odenkirk, who, by the way, I, I left out seeing them made mm-hmm. BJ and I kind of go, oh, wait, our senses of humor are maybe not that far off right. from what could be good. Because they were doing stuff that was sort of what we would do around the house to amuse ourselves. Yeah. And we were like, oh, and that and the Andy Kaufman thing and the 2,000-year-old man thing, we were like, oh, there's stuff mm-hmm. out there like what we're interested in. Right. So to have him ask us that was like, oh, you realize you're the reason we're doing this yeah. for the past two weeks, you know? So, and you know, it took, I still, I think it took still two years for him to make good on Mm -hmm. me writing on the show, but still at the time it was like a huge boost. I think from then on it was like, our second show went really well, Bob asked us to write on a show, at that point I think it was like I considered myself to be a comedian. Yeah. Jesus God. 
listening to you describe those sketches uh, reminds me that there, there is something about your humor and the humor of your podcast where, despite the fact that you are going through the, the paces of yes and and all that mm-hmm. that shit, you do break a lot of the rules in a really creative way. Is that important to you? Is it conscious? It's interesting. I mean, I part of the part of the issue for me um, as a performer is the UCB improv uh, or the UCB school out here in LA mm. of improv didn't come around until two thousand five, I believe. Okay. So, um, and most of the improv that that was out here previous to that, I didn't really respond to. Okay. Um, but I really responded to the UCB school of it. So part of the issue for me as a performer is I didn't... By the time UCB came here, I was already a 35-year-old man. And yeah. I taught sketch at the in the first... You know, when the school... I was the first sketch teacher, mm-hmm. you know? So I thought it was weird. And I'd been on Mr. Show, and I, you know... I've had sketch shows. I thought it was weird to take improv classes yeah <laughs> you yeah, know yeah. i still think like i still think about oh i should take some improv classes but I, but i just feel weird doing it of course you know around 20 year old kids yeah. you know what i mean and uh-huh. i would have to go through sure level one i mean everyone has to go through all I, I hate those people that i hear about who are kind of famous who come in and go can't i just go right to level three i don't want to be around beginners right no i mean you have to you know mm-hmm. so i've always felt weird about it mm-hmm. so And I always sort of envy the people like, you know, Paul Rust or Neil Campbell, who Mm -hmm. were really young when the school first opened. They went up through the the ranks, and Mm -hmm. they they took level one immediately, and now they're... Because I I see the freedom in their performance that is so fun Yeah. um, that I wish I had that background. So I don't have that kind of background, you know? So when you say breaking the rules, I, like, have a a general sense of what the rules are of improv. Right. But... I think a lot of my style, especially earlier on in the show, was about breaking the rules, about doing bad improv. As I said, you are a, a member of the New Wave School. Yeah, that's right. Now, what is your... I to do the New Wave pictures. Now, what is your picture about? It's... it's uh, what is it called, by the way? Rape. <laughs> <laughs> what, well, could you tell us a little about your picture? Some of the, how does your picture well, open? Well, we start to, to, uh, with, the, with a new wave. We, uh, the camera waits until there's a good wave coming in. And when it looks like a new wave... <laughs> and you filmed it. We filmed that wave, and then the wave breaks. And when the wave breaks, there's two people on the beach raping each other. I see. And what are you trying to say in your film? We're trying to say that there's much immorality in our society. <laughs> I see. And you show this by... Uh, by showing a lot of rape and <laughs> filth and dirt. And uh, people love to see the immorality so they know not to do that. I see. I see. see uh, and, but is very that, ethical and is moral, there anything, actually. Is there anything in the film that would be, well, other than rape? I mean, you can't do a whole film. No, no, no. Then there's the, uh, near the end, there's contrition, where the, uh, all the raped people <laughs> feel that uh, they have uh, done uh, wrong. a dirty thing. Does somebody wrong. lead them out yes. of this? Is there and a yes, hero yes. in the picture? Oh, yes, the Good. avocado man. We have an avocado <laughs> picker who comes to a grove of avocados, and the people somehow know he's symbolic of goodness and the avocado. <laughs> Because the avocado is good. Yes. And he walks through the grove, and the, all the people are very contrite, and they cry about the, their rape and their terror, and they follow him to the church to pray for their salvation. I see. So it And on the way to the church, the Turkish army comes and rapes them all. <laughs> because we like to finish a picture with a rape, you know? <laughs> yes, it's... So it ties it up. But that, there's something in anti-comedy that I really respond to yeah. that, that Neil and Paul and I, when we did that podcast I mentioned, that was all about anti-comedy of, like, a good sketch is three minutes? Well, we're not even going to get to it for eight. Right, right. We're yeah. going we're gonna to fuck with each other and try to um, derail everything mm-hmm. and make each other laugh until, until finally one of us brings up the sentence that we said would start the sketch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So, and that is really, really funny to me. Yeah. And, there's some, and that's a lot what this record is to me is um, Carl Reiner trying to steer it and then Mel Brooks trying to derail it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's, that's what a lot of great comedy is, is, sure. is derailing each other, mm-hmm. is, 
you know, when when Carl Reiner on this record says, "Did you know Michelangelo?" Um, you know, Mel Brooks saying, "Oh yeah, I hated him." Mm -hmm. is derailing it in sure. a way. Yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. because y you expect him to go, oh, yeah, I knew him, he was great, I always had a, 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 right. an appreciation for his talent, you mm -hmm. know? For, but for Mel Brooks to go, yeah, he was the first guy to use a roller. <laughs> Only on the background. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, it is like... So good. You know, it, that's what a lot of comedy is, I think. So, so as far as breaking the rules, I don't have as firm a grasp on the rules as I wish I had, mm -hmm. you know? But, um... But it, you know, yeah, it is a little bit, a little bit of that, definitely. It seems like those are a different set of tools for if if, if you need them, though. To be fair, I mean, not to say that we don't always have something to learn, but I, I feel like listening, uh, you know, it, 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 your style of humor is its own thing. I guess I can understand you saying you want to do, you take traditional improv if you thought you'd be comfortable doing it. But it, what to you is the appeal of? of I feel like a lot of what Andy Kaufman did, as far as you know, anti-humor, like mm -hmm. you say, is is obviously the severe end of what they're doing on this album, and sort of there's a discomfort aesthetic. But is that? Mm -hmm. Do you think that's the reason it's done? Is it done to challenge people? Is it artistic, or is it just done? Hmm. I don't know. There there are a, different, a number of different reasons you could we, do it. You know, another another a couple of of the other records that I could have picked mm -hmm. um, are Steve Martin's records, which sure. were also he, my friend. Back in high school, those were the other things that we listened to all the time. We listened to him in his car, you sure. know, driving around all the time. And that's a lot of anti-comedy, or what yeah. I view as, as anti-comedy. So, um, what is its role? I mean, you know, it, it. I think I think a lot of times it's just kind of like breaking. You get tired of doing the same old thing, you know. Yeah. And Steve Martin could have. I don't know that he, that he could have been a regular comedian. Yeah, comedian. You know, I don't know that he could have been an observational comedian. I, I don't think his brain works that way. You know what I mean? And, yeah. And as much as I've tried being an observational comedian, I've done stand up. Mm -hmm. um, I I gave it up. I didn't give it up. Um, I still could do it, but sure. But I, I my interests don't really lie that way because I'm I'm a little more interested in in stuff that is different than that. You know. So I don't know. I don't know. I mean. Kaufman just was on another level of stuff that you couldn't even conceive of anyone doing at the time. Yeah. You know, um, and, and certainly my, my humor is not at that level. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, very influenced by other stuff. Sure. Doing kind of a Letterman meets Pee Wee pastiche on the TV show, mm -hmm. and, you know, but still trying to make it my own voice, you know. Yeah. How, so is there any level of preparation for the podcast other than here's the name of the case? Is it even that far? I mean, yeah, I, I was thinking right? about this a lot because of this record, and I was, you know, reading, um, when I was re-listening it, to it to do, to do this, um, I also read a bunch of articles about it and just tried to get back into what I really liked about it. And um, these guys, I mean... You, when I say that Carl Reiner sounds like he's trying to corral something in the mm -hmm. first one, I think that they had like little pre-planned bits, sure, um, that worked really well at the parties mm -hmm. that Carl was trying to get Mel to do because mm -hmm. he knew we're making a record, we got to get these pre-planned bits going yeah. a little bit. And so, to answer your question, I think that my show used to be a little more like that. Okay, um, when. I first started having characters on it, it was because I'd seen the characters do these bits on stage. Mm -hmm. So I'd seen Andy Daly do um, this character in a ten-minute bit. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the first ones we did was the... Uh, that I remember really well is the guy who wants to commit suicide by buying a heavy coat <laughs> and going into the ocean. I can't remember his name. But um, I think... I'm pretty sure I'd seen that bit on stage. Okay. So early on, I was sort of doing what Carl Reiner was doing on the first record, which mm -hmm. is trying to ask the questions that will set up the bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like iBrain, for instance, Brett Gellman's iBrain thing, uh -huh. even though I'm acting with mock uh, indignation, mm -hmm. I'd seen that bit several times. I knew it backwards and forwards. I knew when to interject mm -hmm. and... and act like it was upsetting to me, you yeah. know. So early on in the show, it definitely was a lot more like that. But then, 
and it, and it sort of goes hand in hand with the fact that I don't have any formal training. I, I sort of was like, uh, I don't know how funny I can be. I'm, I should be more... I, I knew, because I'd been on Jimmy Pardo's Never Not Funny, that I was a relatively gregarious guest. Sure, sure. And so I figured I could, I could be that as a host. I would just be kind of funny every mm-hmm. once in a while. But I, I do remember the moments, and I think it was, it was on that um, heavy coat one with Andy Daly, mm-hmm. where I started just really asking pointless questions to him uh-huh. to try to supposedly to try to flesh out this story but mm-hmm. in my mind to derail him and mm-hmm. to make him come up with things that he wouldn't come up with and there was some weird magic about it where I started really focusing on the coat mm-hmm. and where he bought the coat <laughs> and he would he sort of answered the question he's such an amazing improviser he answered the questions for a while but then like turned it back on me like why are you so obsessed with the coat uh-huh. i feel like we're getting off on on, a, on on i feel like you're focusing on the wrong part of the story <laughs> cuz he's talking about how he's committing suicide yeah and i just remember listening back to that one and it may have been the first time i tried sort of doing that mm-hmm. and because he's so skilled i felt like it was something I could do, and I, I remember that being a big moment in the in the podcast for me. Of yeah. oh, this there's some intangible magic that happens when you go off script a little. Yeah. Um, so, rounding back to answer your question, now I would say zero percent of it is is planned. Yeah. Um, the. M- Usually what will happen is, say, Bobby Moynihan the other week came in. We didn't talk beforehand. Mm -hmm. He just said, hey, I'm going to do your show at this time. I said, great, I'll see you there. Mm -hmm. He shows up. We all sit down. I say, so what do you want to do? He says, I think I'm going to be an orphan. I said, great, (laughs) let's start. (laughs) And we press record. Holy crap. And everything that you hear on that is all improv. Jesus All Christ. us not knowing where it's going to go. Mm-hmm. He didn't plan anything. I, I think the most he... Pro- I, I don't want to speak for him, but... Probably the most he planned out is that he was looking for a father or something. Uh-huh. I don't even think he knew his name. Yeah. I think that's... Sometimes you forget to even come up with a name when yeah. you're doing that. So to add, when I was like, so what's your name? And he said, uh, Forville? <laughs> it's like Fivel, but one less. <laughs> like, that's not planned. That's him just being hilarious. Um, oh, so, so none of that is planned. The most I think we'll ever do is every once in a while a person will come on and have a vague idea of some beats that they want to hit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll try to remember to hit those, yeah. you know, but, but a lot of times we don't even get to them. Yeah. So, um, it's a little more planned on the TV show, I would say, um, because we're in a, a so much, under so much of a time constraint. Sure. Three minutes, basically, for each character. Sure. That... We have to have a vague idea of where it's going. But even mm-hmm. even on that, I was just watching the sixth episode today. Mm-hmm. And James Domian is on that one doing Huel Hauser. And we have no plan on that. Like, I've worked with James a lot. I know Huel's game. Mm-hmm. I know where to lead him. But yeah. we had no end to it. We had no beats for it. Mm-hmm. We didn't have time to do it, I remember. I was working constantly, and James just showed up. And we were like, okay, what are we doing? panic in our eyes uh-huh. and then we did it and it, it ends it ends up really funny we came up with a really funny outbeat to it mm-hmm. but all the all that stuff that you hear of like Hulhauser turning into a crowbot on the on the program mm-hmm. and stuff like that none of that is planned right and that's the right. that's the reason that I continue to do this show I think yeah. is because the sheer joy in finding stuff like that just can't be matched I think you must have known many great men in your time many great men I in knew your the time. great and the near great sir did you know Rembrandt Van Ryn we called him Rembrandt. You knew him? Yes. You know, uh, Rembrandt was one of the first to use the roller. <laughs> what? <laughs> How can you possibly? The roller, you mean the... The little roller, roller yes. Oh. Only for the background. Rembrandt didn't eat much. You know, he used to... He just, money always went for paint, and the money always went for paint. Occasional girl, and then paint. <laughs> and paint, and paint, and then a girl, then paint, and a girl, then paint, and then for a long time, just girls. <laughs> How about Michelangelo? Did you ever How know? about him? <laughs> Is that all you care to say about yeah. him? Yeah, nice fella. Used to come in the store once in a while. Michelangelo was one of your customers. Oh, a big customer. Did he ever pay you off in no, a piece of No, he used to cuff him a lot. 
What? Yeah. Oh, you really? I put him on a cover. Did, yeah. did you think of taking Those a piece of his... Those never had money. Well, didn't you think of taking a piece of his art? It would be worth... I thought it stunk. Who knew? <laughs> Why did I you I would have gladly that? taken it. Why did you think that? Of course, there's all people flying around, you know. It wasn't like a nice picture of somebody on a pony. <laughs> it wasn't nice. <laughs> they were naked, too. Yes, and they're naked. You can't oh. hang a naked in your living room. They do now. Now, well, now they're modern and dirty. <laughs> and then we were clean and cute. I think I've honestly asked you every question I normally ask people. You normally? Well, let's get yeah. to the abnormal let's questions. The, the, the strange ones. Kinky. Yeah. What are you into? <laughs> what? Ah, God, I just wonder. I have asked Mel Brooks to come on the podcast, and no, it's not going to happen. But I have uh. asked, is there any, like, dream guest like for you on your show, either as uh-huh. an improviser or an actual guest? Well, um, Pee Wee Herman was a, or Paul Rubens God, was a, yeah. was a huge one for me. Yeah. Um, that's another big influence on me when I was, again, 15 yeah. is when that movie came out, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and, um, he's a giant influence on me, so, and I, I chased him forever. Yeah. It took two years Holy for shit. me to get him on the show. Yeah. Of me bugging his publicity rep mm-hmm. and finally it all came together so that that i think is the most nervous i've ever sounded on the show uh-huh. like i think you can audibly hear me um my my voice shaking at certain times <laughs> you know and, and, and it doesn't help that it's in front of a live audience yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. as well which are you know i i enjoy doing the shows in front of live audiences but i'm certainly more comfortable in the studio yeah, so yeah, yeah. so that one i was very nervous for um we tried to get david letterman Mm-hmm. On Between Two Ferns, the special we just did, yeah, yeah. that didn't end up working out. That's too bad. Um, but he's a giant to me that I'll, I'm sure I will never get to talk to. I actually just went to his show for the first time a few weeks ago. Really? Um, for as giant um, of an influence he is on me, I never. I always wanted to go to a show and I never made it out yeah. until a few weeks ago. Oh shit! This is 30 years for him, isn't it? Yeah. He's, holy crap! Yeah. Damn. So. That's that would be huge for me. I remember, um, I remember, I always wanted to get certain people on the the live show, the live stand up show, and mm-hmm. I was always, like, I was obsessed with getting Rodney Dangerfield at one point, yeah. and then the minute it pops in my head, I like started to try to explore how to ha- have it happen, and then he passed away right yeah. away. Um, you know, I, was, I Seinfeld was a big influence on me before his TV show. Yeah. Like, I was really into his comedy for a long time. Um, so, you know, people like that, I mean, you know, I, I just, I have so much respect for comedy, and I grew up a huge comedy nerd, and mm-hmm. so, you know, Bill Murray would be huge, you know, I'm, I'm basically throwing out names of people it's, I will never get to talk to. It's okay, it's okay, <laughs> I, I, I like knowing who people's influences are, because mm-hmm. there are people who haven't heard of a lot of people that I love, you know, like and it weirds me out. Uh, I'm trying to think who I mentioned last time, one of my, well, I, I would mention somebody like, uh, I've mentioned Frank Gorshin to an impression, uh, oh, yeah. Amy Phillips was on. Oh, my great. Podcast. Oh, I love and I first heard her on your podcast mm-hmm. because of her fucking amazing Liza Minnelli. Yeah. And uh, I brought up Frank Gorshin and she, had, she didn't She know. didn't know. Oh, oh cool. So, like, you know, which I was surprised. It's about. always interesting when you see something like that. It, 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 like, because I knew Frank Gorshin as the Riddler yeah. growing up, and that's all I knew. Yeah. And so to see, and you always just assume, oh, he was an actor who grew to fame as the Riddler. Yeah. Then you see him do his impressions on, um, I probably saw him on, uh, Ed, no, not Ed, Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan. Yeah. And it, like, hits you, like, oh, that's why he's the Riddler. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's like Jim Carrey is the Riddler because he had this yeah. thing going on. Yeah, his impressions were really amazing. And I didn't did Burt Lancaster? Did Amy Phillips for not knowing who Frank Gorshin was. You know, there's plenty of people. I, I didn't know oh, Ernie, yeah. Ernie Kovacs before I started this podcast, to be fair. Er, yeah, I, I watched a bunch of him when I was probably 20. Uh-huh. I never could get into it. Really? For some reason, yeah. E- even though I would... Thinking back, some stuff we do on the show is probably very kind of Ernie Kovacs ish. Yeah. Some stuff we do on the TV show. Mm hmm. Um, but for some reason, I, I never could get into it. It's hard because it's experimental comedy, so it, mm-hmm. it, I, I, it, that's, that's even It's almost like you have to be there sometimes, too, to for go, sure. oh, that's what he's reacting to. Yeah. And realizing mm-hmm. that it's the first time anybody was doing any of this mm-hmm. stuff. Nobody was playing with Chroma Key at the time. Yeah. But there's a lot of stuff like that, like the movie Jaws, where. Mm-hmm. I didn't see that until I was maybe 27 years old yeah. or something, and I just assumed it's going to be like Ernie Kovacs for me, where mm-hmm. I'm going to watch it, and, and I'll have seen the parodies of it, mm-hmm. and, and the movies that are influenced by it so much that it won't have any effect on me, but like Jaws is still 
great, and I was like, oh, this is amazing. Yeah. Like, you always want something to transcend that sort of thing where it, mm-hmm. it, it really hits you where, where it can. An- another huge influence on me was Bob Hope. Yeah. I live on Bob Hope Street, actually, which uh-huh. was a giant thrill for me to awesome. move into his neighborhood, but um, he was probably growing up the guy that I was really influenced by, and actually, when we, when BJ and I started doing our duo act, mm-hmm. it was a combination of Bob and Bing, mm-hmm. uh, and Martin and Lewis, those were the two old school, yeah. uh, uh, touchstones that we had, mm-hmm. so it was a cross between those two things, wow. and Kaufman, Cross, Odenkirk, Awesome. Um, so it was us trying to to put both of those things together, but but we even I remember <laughs> um, we had one routine where we were um, where I talked about how my grandfather was an entertainer during World War II, mm-hmm. but he was for the other side, <laughs> and so we both reenacted. He was in a duo act as well, mm-hmm. and so we reenacted this Nazi um, oh, vaudeville shit. act, oh, God. and uh, we sang a song um, that uh, BJ wrote. <laughs> And uh, and Eben Schletter wrote the music too, mm-hmm. and like we straight up ripped off something in Road to Utopia, I think uh-huh. it is, or Road to Rio, one okay. of those movies. But I think I think it's Road to Rio. I think they uh, cr- uh, Hope and Crosby start with a dance routine, mm-hmm. and we just straight up like we were like in the middle of the routine. I have a little musical theater background. I was doing mm-hmm. a little tap and stuff, and. We were like, okay, we need to do something here. What do we do? And mm-hmm. so we watched Road to Rio, and they do this hilarious bit where. Um, where Bing puts his hands down like mm-hmm. he's going to give Bob Hope a lift and have him do a flip. Uh-huh. And Bob puts his foot on it, and then they jump up in the air about one foot off the ground to go, Hey! Oh, awesome. And it's really, really funny. We were like, well, let's just try that. And, you know, we did it and just straight up ripped it off. But at the same time, you know they were ripping it off from someone sure. too. So, you of know. course. But, yeah, we're really into those guys. Yes, yes, it's a very exclusive community, yes. Why is it so exclusive? Well, we don't allow children, for one thing. You mean a whole city without children? We do have children. What do you do with but them? we send them to Hartford. Well, who takes care of them? Jewish and Italian families, people who like children. You know, we're, <laughs> we're not crazy about children, you know. I see, I see. Uh, are, sir, are you married? Uh, yes, Where I, do you live? I'm very happily married. I live right in Connecticut, Connecticut. You have children? <laughs> I have six darling children. Where? I'm sorry, four. Make that four. Four. Yes. I have four. Where are they, sir? Uh, they're in Hartford, living with an Italian... <laughs> lovely Italian couple taking care of them for us. Do you yes. see them often? Do you visit them? Oh, yes. Of a Sunday, of a Tuesday, uh, of one of those uh, days, I, I might just mosey over to Hartford and hire a gang, you know, and then speed right back to Connecticut, Connecticut. You mosey over and speed back. Yes. If you were to, and this is the, the final question, the one I'd forgotten. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. If you were to recommend this album to people, which I assume you are since you did. Oh, yeah. Why? For somebody who's never maybe even listened to Mel Brooks or never, obviously never heard the album, what's what's the reason you would say? I mean, if, if you want to hear a comedian just at the height of his intelligence coming up with stuff so quickly that you wouldn't believe it, um, you should definitely listen to this. I mean, and the other part of it is, unlike a lot of stand-up records, a lot of sketch records, it is improv. I mean, it's the most, it's the thing that's most akin to certainly my podcast, but a lot of podcasts out there Mm -hmm. where it's just people riffing and thinking of stuff really, really quickly. And the reason I picked the third one out of all of them, and I would just say listen excuse me, listen to all of them, but the reason I picked the third one is I think it has the highest ratio of bits that really, really work. Yeah. And and for me, the most classic lines in it, I think the the line where Mel Brooks describes the difference between tragedy and comedy... I didn't know that came from this album until today. That's crazy. crazy. It's so great. And it sounds... That actually sounds like it may have been something he'd said before. Yeah. But the fact that he pulls it... Yeah. Really quickly, mm-hmm. um, and all based on a suggestion from Carl Reiner. I mean, it, it's not like they had planned that out of like, oh, let's go into the comedy tragedy bit. Right. It really was just like, 
and, and maybe it was, maybe it was Carl Reiner knowing that he that Mel Brooks had this in reserve or something, and like mm-hmm. s- setting him up and just teeing him up so that Mel Brooks could knock it out of the park. But sure. but this record has the most, the, the highest ratio I think of just bits that really really work, as well as it has the best non two thousand year old man characters that yeah. um, Mel Brooks does. I think the uh, I think. Actually, the the second record, the 2001 years, I love the third best poet. That's really wow. akin to something that we do on Comedy Bang Bang. Mm-hmm. But um, I love Dr. Felix Weird is great. Yeah. It really is like, the th- by the, the first record, Mel Brooks is trying a lot of different types of characters, mm-hmm. and not all of them work. The, the I, I know the um, Fabiola is like a minute and a half, uh-huh. and it's him doing a... Um, basically an impression of a 60s coffee house singer uh-huh. and all the only joke to it is he's like hey that's it you know there's there's no joke to it uh-huh. but by the third record he figured out what works i think for him and mm-hmm. so all there's four tracks on it and on all four of them he's playing variations of the, of the 2000 year old man mm-hmm. just with different voices so i think it's yeah. the best one out of all of them just for that reason and so i mean to to me it's just they're some of the best best records of all time just because there's stuff on them that you would never hear anywhere else and it's all just because they happen to have a tape recorder running and they are incredibly quick yeah thank you so much for coming here my pleasure and plug things that need to be plugged please. sure well I mean I, I, I want everyone to watch the comedy bang bang TV show it starts June 8th on IFC um, when does this come out if, if I'm you... gonna try and edit it and put it up tonight so. oh great okay so uh very soon there will be an episode streaming um, mm-hmm. at ifc.com. I think on the 24th oh. there will be a, our second episode, complete episode, will be up there with Amy Poehler and um, uh, Andy Daly and David Keckner. Awesome. And so if people are into comedy, and I, I, I imagine you are if you're listening to this, our very first episode on Ju- June 8th has Zach Galifianakis, Andy Daly, Will Forte, Thomas Lennon, Gillian Jacobs, Jesus. me and Reggie Watts. Um, as well as some other people, so it's it's really every single episode. Um, you'll see what a comedy nerd I am because mm-hmm. they are packed with comedians in it, and mm-hmm. and I believe our eighth episode, I have Dave Thomas from SCTV. He's playing my father. Like it, it working on this show, I got to meet so many amazing comedians. I got to put so many amazing comedians in there. There's like places where. Will Arnett pops up doing a couple of lines and then he's gone, you know. I mean, normally, normal shows would have Will Arnett. He'd be there the sure. entire half hour. Yeah. Like, my show, I just try to fit as much comedy as I can into it. I have great people who, who would would drop by and do me a favor. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I think the show is really special. Um, fans are really going to enjoy it. Fans of the podcast, I think, will see that it's a lot like the podcast, but it, it's... It's a TV show, and I'm sure. really, really proud of it, and I think people will really enjoy it. That's amazing. That sounds so exciting. Uh, Twitter, you are... are you just At Scott Ackerman. All right. Just, yeah, the normal. All A-U-K. Right. And go to earwolf.com. Comedy, is it comedybangbang.com or the path? Comedybangbang.com is out there. Okay. Also, yeah, earwolf.com. Also, you know, and listen to the show every single week. I'm still going to continue to do the podcast. Uh, if I could do it during production of the show, I can continue on, That's you know, true. so... I definitely, it's very important to me. I got the TV show because of the podcast, so I'm going to continue to do it. Sure. That's awesome. Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure, Brian. Thank you. And uh, I will also very quickly say, uh, come to the live episode of, of this show, which is going to be uh, Monday, May 28th, 7.30, IO West. Buy your tickets online, please. And uh, Who's the guest? Uh, David Anthony Higgins. Oh, and, great. And uh, also okay. my buddy Jeremy uh, Guskin, who was awesome. And was say on. hi to David for me. I will. We're old buddies. Ask him about the wrong guy. I, you hosted... Did you not host mm-hmm. the showing of that at... Okay. At Santa Family, yeah, That's yeah. where I got to meet him for the first time. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I love got that to meet Dave Foley and almost shit myself. It's yeah, Foley's exciting. great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a very nice guy. Yeah, that movie's amazing. Time. Watch the wrong guy, everyone. Get a DVD of it. Brilliant. If yeah. you can find it. Yeah. All right. Thank you again. Thanks. And uh, everybody, have a good thing. <laughs> How did you feel about the... The motion picture, Stanley Kramer's motion picture, Judgment in Nuremberg. Unfair. (laughs) Uh, Why did you consider it unfair?
Well, because he didn't tell the whole truth. Uh, uh, what was the picture about, really, about a, a misunderstanding, really, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, look, you have, uh, you, you send people to camp, don't you, in the summer? <laughs> we sent a few people to camp. I don't know what the whole fuss is about. Well, sir, um... Sent some nice people to sir, camp. Sir, did you, did you know Hitler? Mostly in the summer. <laughs> How did you feel about Adolf Hitler personally? Oh, well, I, I, I thought that he made some terrible errors. Uh, <laughs> losing the war was a big error. <laughs> <laughs> made a couple of blunders, yeah. Comedy on Vinyl is recorded at Fort Awesome Studios in beautiful downtown Burbank, California. Our producer is Mike Warden, our host is Jason Klom, and he's also the editor. Comedy on Vinyl is a stolen dress entertainment production. You can check out all of our other podcasts, books, videos, other audio stuff, probably some writing, at StolenDress.com. And uh, please check out Comedy on Vinyl at Facebook.com slash Comedy on Vinyl, Twitter.com slash Comedy on Vinyl. And please subscribe to us on iTunes, rate us highly, and spread the word. Thank you so much for listening to Comedy on Vinyl this week, and have a very good thing. Strength the skin of some strong dead on the floor it looks so dab like a man been flattened out. I said to her, Mary and your garbage does look queer. She said, That's my first old man and whispered in my ear. Never let your braces dangle, dingle, dingle, dangle. Poor old sport, he got golden rang right through the mangle. Over the